Hello. Hello, everybody. It's four o'clock. I'm on time. Hopefully, you can hear me. Can someone in the little comment section down the bottom here let me know that I'm coming through loud and clear? That would be great. And always there's a bit of a lag on these, so I won't get an answer straight away. So I'll assume you can hear me for a bit, and uh, we shall uh, wait for somebody to say, yes, we can hear you, Gary. Or, or no, we're lip reading, one of the two. <laughs> lots of you, lots of you. <laughs> Feels like a blind date, brilliant. Oh, we've got six, yes, brilliant, thank you, Amber, brilliant. Okay, so there's, oh gosh, there's already about 64 of you up there, which is lovely. Fantastic, I know I've got people in from all over the place. Nikki, that's Canada, America, uh, Belgium I saw as well. That's great, that's lovely. And Hawley, obviously, we've got a few there too. Uh, great, loud and clear, that's good. Um, well, welcome everybody um, to a slightly earlier live session than we did last week. Um, quite a few people afterwards said to me, could you do one so that the kids can um, join in or whatever? And uh, so I thought, yeah, I'll do one at four o'clock this week. I'm in the kitchen again because the light is best in here, really, coming through, filtered through the window. It's south-facing, so it's not too glary. Uh, so that should work. So um, I thought what I'd do today is, rather than just sit here and... Um, <laughs> rather than just sit here and uh, take requests, I'm going to talk a little bit about some techniques and tips and stuff like that. And I'll answer questions if anybody's got any particular drawing tips and questions they want to ask me as well. Do, don't forget, of course, that this stuff keeps coming up at the bottom and I, I know I can scroll back, but I can't catch every question every time. So if you've got a particular question and I haven't answered it, ask me again and hopefully I'll catch you at some point. Um, I will stay on here for at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half to see how we go until you all get too bored of me. Hello, Chicago. Um, so, and hello Northampton, this is great. So we're up 89, lovely. Um, so what I thought I'd do, I, some of you are probably new to the stream, some of you have watched before, but I'm going to run over a couple of things, questions people have asked me before, um, things about, about the drawing in general. Um, this is the sketchbook I've bought specially for these live uh, streams, which is a lot bigger than how I usually work. Um, the, the Doodler Day, which is how most of you know me, um, I work in one this size, which is that big. Okay, so this is a great deal bigger. So obviously I'm using uh, different pens to what I would usually use. The drawing will be a little bit more crude than it is in here. I mean, you can see, um, where's last night's? Here we go. Let's get last night's off. So that was last night's Doodle. Um, it's all back to front, obviously, because we're um, we're flopped on here. I did that writing backwards, though, so that you could read it. Though I did, I, did, I wrote that back to front, um, just like Leonardo da Vinci. <clears throat> so that's the size I usually work. And um, people have often asked me, um, how many sketchbooks do you have? Do you have? Um, by that, I mean how many do I have on the go? I assume. So this is my Doodle Day sketchbook which is a paper chase, brown paper uh, book. Um, I also have uh, th these lovely sketchbooks by Pink Pig Sketchbooks, which is what I'm doing my flower drawings in that I do every morning. Um, oh, you haven't seen that one yet. That's one for tomorrow. I always work a day ahead on the flowers. Um, so I do the flower drawings in here. Um, I also have very nice leather bound sketchbooks in which I do sort of just drawings that I fancy doing, really. Um, there was some I did last year of um, mythical creatures and stuff. But that was in here. So this is the sort of sketchbook I use for just general sort of sketching. And then I also have another one on the go, which is my general sketchbook, just for everyday stuff. I was asked if I could do a Horrid Henry hug. So there's Horrid Henry doing a Horrid Henry hug. Um, I've got a list <laughs> of something I'm about to draw. So that's just a really everyday sketchbook. Um, I also get asked what pens I use. So, for the doodles mainly, I use a uniball. Just a simple uniball pen, black. Um, and then I use a white pencil and a white 
gel pen for the highlighting uh, and just a regular pencil for some of the shading. Uh, another pen I love using is the, um, the brush pen. This is a Faber-Castell brush pen. And they're really nice to work with. But one of my favourite things to draw with is a good old ballpoint. I just love a ballpoint pen. This is quite a heavy one. I quite like a heavy pen. And this was actually a, a souvenir one from the Harry Potter stage show. But it's nice and weighty and I love drawing with Biro. I do all the um, Hot Santa in, in, in those. Anyway, that's that. And, and I have a little, just like a schoolboy, I have a little pencil case that I keep everything in. Right. That's enough of all that. So, I'm going to be doing some drawing and stuff on here and uh, we're going to talk about techniques and things like that. Uh, so, I guess we'll kick off. Um, I hope some of you have got your pads and pens and pencils and paper and whatever ready. You're going to join in with me. And if you do join in and you do stuff that you're pleased with or whatever, can you um, post your pictures later? Carol, why do I use brown paper? I like brown paper because it gives me a mid-tone. So when I'm doing black line, it gives me that, and I can shade to make it a bit darker. But using the white pencil and the white gel pen can pop the highlights. So it just helps to make things stand out a bit and, and helps you focus where I want you to look in the picture. So that's why I use the, um, the brown paper. Good question. Okay, so I'm going to start off... I thought I'd start off with something really straightforward, first of all, and to talk about some of the sort of tips, tricks and rules of drawing um, and then show you how you can sometimes break those rules as well, if that makes sense. So we're going to start with a face, just a straightforward face. And I, a lot of you will know uh, this kind of stuff, okay? I know a lot of you can draw, a lot of you, I'm not teaching anybody anything new, but it's just kind of fun to do this sort of stuff. So a face. Okay, well let's start with a, well I usually start with a circle, which is like the top part of the skull, and then I drop a a jaw on, okay? Then you want to give yourself a centre line. Okay, these, these are rules ready to be broken. Okay, there's a centre line, that gives you your centre of your face. Then let's put a line through the middle. Let's put a line through the middle of that and a line through the middle of that. So you've got a half and then each half broken into another half. And this is what sits underneath the head, okay? So when you're doing a face or something like that, the eyes sit on that line with an eye distance between them. So if you imagine there were three eyes in a row, but the eyes sit that far apart. The bottom of the nose sits at that point there, halfway between the eyes and the chin. And then halfway between the nose and the chin, and that line's a bit low, is where you put your mouth, okay? And then ears, ah, I really enjoyed that. So ears sit in that area between the eyes and the nose, okay? So that is your basic construction rules, if you like, for a face. And if the face is looking up, you curve your, that centre line can then curve up and you add your other lines in there and now the ear would drop down to fit in that area. You see, they're looking up, and then you're looking down. Does the same, you see? So what we've got there is by using that, that basic construction grid, you can make things look up and down, left and right obviously would work the same. So you've got it's going that way, the ear sitting in between there, the mouth there, you see? So Carol you've lost the video, it's probably a connection at your end, it's fine here, I think everyone else can still see, can everyone else still see? Somebody says they've lost the video, assuming I am still here, um, then it means that the problem's at their end, not at my end. Um, we should be all right at this end, I think. I've got quite strong Wi-Fi, so we'll see. Anyway, so that is the basic rules of um, head construction. Now, having said where all those things are, 
you can always break those rules. So, for instance, I said about the nose being half the distance of the thing. There's no reason why, you know, then you can't do a head which has, you know, massive great nose like that and eyes up there. This is turning into Sherlock Holmes, I think. Um, you see, so that, I've now broken all my rules that I just sort of told you about, but you've still got basic construction lines following through. That mouth, although it's that bottom part of the chin is still tiny, we're still sitting in the middle there, and it gives you a sense of anatomy that sits underneath. So once you know the rules, you can then break them. You can go the other way. You can have sort of faces where you've got, um, you know, massive great eyes, no, you know, little tiny nose that goes all the way down there, and then you, you've got, you know. You see, so we're, st we're, we're still following those basic principles. You've still got your centre line, your line across there. I still very always try and keep the ears sitting in the right place in conjunction with the nose. But again, you can break them. It doesn't matter. But having that knowledge is a way to, um, to break the rules and still have some sense of underlying structure. So there you go. Bases. Um, hopefully that was helpful for one or two. Have a little practice of those. Um, I mean, you know, uh, is there any, any questions based around the sort of head structure or faces at all that, you, that, that anyone would like to ask? Um, while I just sort of tickle away up here for a little bit, I can't help fiddling, that's what I do. Um, uh, lots of you, it's nice. Um, coming and going a bit. We seem to be settling around the 100, which is, which is nice for a, 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 a useful number. Um, the last one we did, I think we had about 350 during the course of the thing. We've had about 1,600 since. Eyebrows. Yes. Uh, the brown paper. Ah, you must have come in after, after somebody else um, asked that question. The brown paper gives me a mid-tone. So um, a mid-tone, uh, then I can use the white highlight to help, help things pop. Okay, hair, noses, looking down. Okay. So I did do but looking down just now, Maddie, but in case you missed it... Um, if you, if you drop your centre line down, if you mean looking down with the eyes looking down, you can just literally drop the eyes down like that. I think Maddie asked me that, so I've done a picture of your face. Um, is that, I don't know if that's what you meant. Um, how do you make a real face into a cartoon face and why do you use brown paper? I thought I answered the question about brown paper just now. Um, in fact, I've answered it twice already, so we'll come, you know, I'll post, go back and find it on the recording. Um, uh, noses, right. How do you do on noses? Well, the great thing about noses, if you're trying to do them sort of realistically or whatever, is not to overdraw them, okay? If you think about, you've got a front view of her face and you've got the, oh, these are, these are such scrappy drawings, do excuse me, but you'll get the idea. Okay, so you can get away with just putting the nostrils like that, or a little bit of a side, or just one edge of a nose. You don't need to do a lot of drawing. You can, I mean obviously, you know, if you've got a, a face and you, you want to sort of do more detail in a nose, you know, you could you can put shading and you can give yourself extra bits of shading underneath and all this sort of thing, you know. So you can go in and do this kind of detail. But the great thing is you, you just don't need to put a lot of detail in when you when you do a nose. Uh, someone talked about eyebrows. Okay, let's talk about eyebrows because they're quite fun and they're really useful for um, helping with expression. So, okay, we're going to do a little selection of very simple faces. Okay, so you've got your eyes, nose, mouth. Eyes, nose, mouth. Let's just quickly. So... Obviously, you know, these are, by virtue of what we're doing here, very, very, very simple drawings, okay? Because I want to get through a lot, and I don't want to have a, you sitting there looking at my back for ages while I do beautiful pictures. So these are very loose and broad strokes, if you like, okay? 
So eyebrows. Well, the thickness, the hairiness, the size of the eyebrows is a personal choice. Um, but um, it, the positioning of them is what's interesting. So you can have your neutral eyebrows kind of follow the shape of the top of the eye. If someone's a bit questioning and quizzical or wor worried or concerned, the eyebrows can curve the other way. Put that little creases. Someone's angry, bring the eyebrows in like that. Or if someone's going, what? Questioning, do one of each. <laughs> you see? <laughs> How do you feel about drawing yourself? Um, I, I see my face a lot, so I kind of know what I look like. And, I and it doesn't matter if I insult myself, so I tend to draw myself a lot because that's, that's what I do. Um, so I hope that helps about the, the eyebrow question, yeah? Um, now, somebody else asked another question. It's gone, it, it's gone away. I can't remember what it was. We'll stick with faces for a little bit. Oh, how to turn realistic faces into cartoon faces. Well, again, that's all about pushing the proportions, isn't it? So you think about it. If you've got a, oh gosh, well, me, right? Okay, so if you, if me, approximately, if I'm being sort of realistic-ish, you know, I'm, my proportions are going to be something like that, right? I mean, again, this is really rubbish, but, but you'll get the idea. So that. Now, if I say to myself, mm, okay, there's a lot of forehead here, okay? The, I've got this, um, I've got a, a, a hairline that's deciding to work its way around to my back. So uh, maybe I'd want to exaggerate that. So you can, you would push the forehead and you'd, you'd possibly condense the bottom half of the face to accentuate the forehead. So you would do that. Um, I might decide that it's, it's all about the, the beard and stuff like that. So you, th then you might go, okay, well, let's, let's, let's still do the forehead thing as well. Let's give myself my big potato nose that I've got, my beady eyes. And then you just big up the beard a bit, you know, and the, the, the swoopy hair at the back and the curls and all that. So variations on a theme of degrees of of caricature and cartooning, yeah? How do you make eyes the same size and shape? Ah, interesting one, that one. I see a lot of people drawing eyes and they do one eye and then the other eye. What I would tend to do is, if I'm doing some eyes, say, I tend to do the top of each, say, and then let's put the, the pupil of each, then the two edges, See, so that's what I do. I go back and forth between, between the two. Do you start with faces when designing a character or start with the idea of a pose? I'll come back to hair. Thank you, Stacey. Okay. How, do I start with the face or with the idea of pose? Interesting, a question, that one. So if I'm doing like a, a real illustration, there's a slightly different technique to when I'm doing my doodles. With the doodles, I do all the sketching in my head. Clean with the pen. Uh, there's no sketching first. That's one of, just one of the disciplines I set myself. So quite often I start with the face or with something that's in the foreground. If I'm doing a, um, a pose, a character, I often start with the silhouette. Now I'm going to do a thing here. I'm going to use a red pen and a black pen so you can see the underdrawing and then the, the overdrawing. So for instance, I'm doing a character at the moment for the big draw who's a sort of green man kind of character. Hey. Um, so with him, say for instance, I would do... Can you see the red? Yeah, we can. I do a shape for the head like this, and then I would go right. Here's the here's the body. We're going to go there. It's going to be standing. The, the, it's going to sort of be roughly there. We're going to get the hand on the hip. Um, the other hand can be out like that with a bird sitting on it. I mean that could be something I'm going to do. So I would start, and you can see what I'm doing. And this pen's almost run out, which doesn't help me very much. Is I start with this very basic underdrawing, and that really has pretty much run out, which is really irritating. Um, got a pencil, let's see if that, that shows up anymore. Mm, the light's not brilliant. Right, I might have to get Lily to bring me another pen down or something in a minute. But anyway, you'll get the idea. So I sketch out loosely like that underneath. Then 
I can go in with the pen, I can go, right, okay, so I know where everything is. So, um, this is the character I'm doing for, say, the big drawer at the moment. Uh, bear with me on this one. I will take a little bit of time on this just because it'll be quite nice. To, so you can see now I've put the head in place so we know where that goes. He's got this thing like that. He's got this shoulder bits going there. This isn't going to be perfect because I'm sort of drawing a bit sideways as well. He's got dreads, this character, so they're going to stick out the back there a little bit. Um, hand on the hip, so... He's got his tattoos of the oak and holly on his arms there. That and there. Uh, again, this is really scrappy. This would almost be stage two. I would then clean up over this as well. Um, So you can see that having had the structure underneath to give me the outline, the silhouette, the shape, the energy of the picture, you can then draw over the top. And um, that's where the detail goes in. So he's got his belt, he has a tunic top, and then he has kind of almost sort of Viking cross garter. I'm, I'm going to sort of really tack that in quickly so you get anyway so you get the idea so we draw up the underneath first in that overall shape that is quite a useful thing for when you're trying to get the energy of a picture it's one thing I, when I talk to kids sometimes about drawing I say never worry about doing a clean finished drawing keep your 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 sketching underneath so you can see what you've done a drawing doesn't have to be perfect and clean and finished it's nice to see where it comes from so when I'm drawing, you want to get the through line of the energy. Suppose someone's leaping into the air with excitement, okay? And these are just going to be scrappy drawings, okay? Uh, with a pen that works, let's go that way. So, I would go... You've got that curved through line of an energy, of a leap, you know? Okay, um, if, you, if you're going to have someone crouched and ready to jump, you know, you, you'd think, right, okay, they're going to be, you know, this is the shape underneath it all, something like that. Their arms are going to be back. You have that counter movement of your arms because you're about to leap. So you know they're going to be there. The head thrust forward to sort of look where they're going. Um, yeah? You see what I mean? And then with the twists, so say you want some twists, it's always quite a hard thing to do. I'm going to sort of do a sort of weird lunge now to draw on the bottom of the, of the thing. Um, so if someone's going to be turning one way or the other, think about, again, the, the, the fact that you've got this S-shaped line then that would go through the body. So you've got the, the head looking that way, the chest might be more square on. And then the, then the pelvis will be pushing that way. That means that the feet ah falling off the bottom of the page. Uh, so you've got a twist there. You know they're, they're twisting around through the the energy is pushing in two different directions like that. Uh, nothing ever feels finished. Yes, exactly. Finished is a dirty word. Yeah, any drawing is one that you've abandoned at some point before you destroy it. A finished drawing is one that if you think if I do any more, I'm going to destroy it. I will abandon going any further. I think you're right. That is what I think of as finished. Uh, oh, someone asked about proportions. How do you know about proportions? Well, again, there are rules that you can then break. Okay. Generally, a human figure is around about seven heads tall. Um, but I just sort of see them in my, in my head before I start drawing. You may have noticed underneath, I was drawing a sort of structure underneath. I'll do that again in a, in a, in a dark pen so you can see... Um, what I mean. Um, when I'm doing any kind of figure, I start with all the shapes. And they're all based around the skeleton, but they give you all the little points. It's like one of those artists' um, models. So what you've got is a, a head ball. And then you would have... Let me just come around it. Okay. I would put the, the rib cage ball, the spine, the pelvic ball, like that. And then you go, right, okay, so you're going to have legs, they're going to have a knee in the middle, 
and then they're going to have the feet at the bottom there. So you've got these points you can now build on. And the same with the arms, you're going to have that, you're going to have a hand, you're going to have a hand and a hand there. So you've got this shape, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's, the head's a bit big on that, so actually that would be, yeah, more like that. Yeah, so this is um, what sits underneath any of them, okay? And with that same structure, this is your skeleton. You can build anything on top of this. So you've got your figure, and I'm gonna make this one really messy because I'm gonna draw over it a couple of times. But imagine, you know, you're putting your face, you've got your arms, you've got your the character. Now we're now we're sort of building it up now, you know, and the, you're putting the clothes onto it and uh, all that sort of thing. So you, you've got, you've built up on top of that character, okay? But you can also make that a bigger character. There's no reason why you can't go, okay, that one's gonna have a big old tum, because you're adding the flesh on top. So, just make the arms bigger at that point with the head there, just put the chin, the legs. Do you see what I mean? But underneath it all, you've still got that same simple structure which I was using here on this page. The, all the circles, all those circles, all those shapes that sit underneath that help you twist and turn and find your structure that's underneath. Because it's all about what's underneath the structure, isn't it? Um, hands is something that a lot of people have questions about as well. How do you get hair to look accurate? Right, I'll go back to that in a second. Keep reminding me about that one, Maddie. Um, just a quick one about hands then. Hands, yeah, they're tricky. But again, I use the same principle as I would use for the, for the rest of the body. So if you think about it, you've got the hand, you've got the, your circle for the palm. I tend to use the middle finger as a, as a guide, and then you've got one knuckle one side of the other. The middle finger is the longest, shorter, shorter, and then the index finger slightly shorter again, and then the thumb comes off the side there, okay? And then they've got the joints in the middle. So again, you can, you can add the detail once you've got the under drawing in, and then you put the nails on, and you have a hand. And um, hands are great; they're wonderfully expressive things. They, you know, they make fantastic shapes. So, you know, you can you, you make it point by just saying, right, okay. So the, the the main finger is going to point there. The thumb is going to wrap around. The second finger is curled. The thumb wraps around that. So that's how you're pointing. But you're. You'll notice I'm not starting with an outline, just going around. I'm building up from around an overall shape. Yeah? Um, hand underneath. You've got the circle, the hand. You've got that, that middle finger there, and then two others in. Yay! Peace, man. Okay, and... Um, Assuming the underdrawing is in pencil so that you could erase. Yes, if you want it to be a finished picture, you can do it in light pencil and erase it, or you could do it in pen and then put another sheet of paper and use a light box to draw through. Um, or you can just leave the rough work showing as well. That's the other thing. I'd, I often quite like the rough stuff to show underneath. How would you make a hand hold something like a stick? Mikey wants to know. Mikey is nine and would like to know how to make a hand hold something. Right, good question, Mikey, okay. Draw the stick first. There's the stick, okay? Now this hand is gonna be holding it here. So you know the palm is going to be behind the middle of the stick, there. So let's get the thumb around it. And again, you can also do almost like bubble balloon shapes to sort of, to make it work. So now, this is quite interesting because fingers all go in different lengths and positions. They don't all end up lined up. So. You can do, and then quite often the little finger may not quite reach like the rest does. And then, there you go. So that line there obviously would be one you'd erase. So that's holding 
the stick. Do you see what I mean? Is it Angra paper? No, nothing is fancy. It's simply a very cheap paper chase scrapbook on very on fairly heavyweight cheap brown paper. Um, but it works for me. It's as good as Angra paper as far as I'm concerned. It hasn't got quite the same weave as that. But if it was too weavy, it wouldn't work well with my, the pens that I usually use. Um, so, Mikey, I hope that helped you with the, with the hand-holding um, thing. Now, Maddie asked a couple of times about hair. Again, with hair, I tend to think of that in, 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 in volumes and shapes. So rather than thinking about individual hairs, I think... Uh, oh, good. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you like that, Mikey. Um, so you've got... Again, let's do... Let's do four heads. Let's just give them the most basic faces, shall we? Right, here, 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 here. So we're talking about hair in general. Um, tips for proportions of the face, that was Becca. Becca, if you go back to the start of the video, when this finishes, check the recording online. I, the first 10, 15 minutes was all about face proportions. It's what I kicked off with. Um, it, there's a load of stuff back there about that. So if you check back onto the timeline when this is all over, uh, you'll be able to see how that works. Right, so hair. I often think about where the hairline is. <laughs> Some are higher than others. Um, but let's just put a hairline in all of these, just so you've got somewhere to work from. Because hair generally, you know, comes from a hairline. So think about that. Don't just plop it on like a wig. Right, let's have a big sweep over. So you think, right, let's think of it in chunks of hair. So someone who has hair. And remember, it's, it's got life to it. It's got movement and width. So you've got these chunks and shapes, okay? Then you look, where's the undersides? The undersides are there. So that's where you can put more shading. Put a couple of bits of shading there. Little few lines there. You don't need the actual hairline drawn. You can take that out eventually. Following the shapes as you go around, and then um, if you've got the option to, you know, you can highlight to make it go. So that gives you shapes like that. Oh, that's all right, Becky. I have to apologise. Yeah, it's at the beginning. You may have missed the beginning. So just go back at the recording, and you can you can see about the face shapes. That's fine. Um, right, this one can be a straight a straight back, slick back. Again, we could just follow that hairline. Let's make this darker hair so you could shade it in a lot more, like that, but leave some of those construction lines in to give you that. Then you might want to do, okay, I'll do a fringe last. Okay, then you might want to do someone with, with, with sort of curly hair. Now, quite often with that, what I might do is give myself the edges there. And then you think, right, what's the overall silhouette of the curly hair going to be? It's going to be bigger like that. Don't think you have to draw all the curls. Just think about overall outside shapes and then pick a few curls that you want to pick out. And do them and, and catch that outside and just do a few of the shapes and again like that and there's someone mentioned about fringes again the fringe is going to come from there so that's going to be your point where the fringe is going to part so it's going to come forward and I give myself the overall shape of the fringe but then remember the rest of the hair is going to be going back other directions from the fringe possibly so it's a what section there section there section there and then the hair is coming down off the back there did that I hope that helps a little bit about the, the fringe question um, right tips and tricks lots of fun okay um, I'm gonna move on to animals a bit now and I'm going to show you how that some of the things we've talked about in here, um, the same rules apply. Um, now how do you fight the curse of the flat figure? The bit where you realise it's sort of slanting more to one side than it's oh, yeah. the flat. Uh, just trial and error. And by doing that underdrawing first, when I talked about doing the, uh, this stuff where you're drawing all the sort of loose stuff underneath first, if you get that right, the rest of it should actually um, 
Ah, yes, that's a very good question. Jilly, thank you. Before we move on to the animals, let's just do the kids and adults bit. Okay. Remember I talked about proportions earlier on uh, with the thing. So an adult face, I'll do, just do two side by side and they'll be cartoony ones, but you'll get the idea. So an adult face. Um, is, is basically that, yeah? So with a child, children's heads proportionately are bigger at the top, their eyes sit bigger, and their features are more sort of squashed at the bottom of their face. So if you did a child's head, but do it the same size as an adult one, quite often what you're doing is pushing the bottom half of the features in, and, and you would do the smaller, like an adult nose might be bigger, but a child's one would be smaller, the eyes would be bigger. Children's eyes grow faster, it start big, and they don't grow as much as the rest of their faces. So that's why children's eyes look big, is because they're sort of almost adult sized eyes in a child face. So, so that's how you do that, that, that sort of difference. So that's a child's head drawn the same size as an adult head, but you can see how the proportions are just slightly different. The eyes are a little bit lower down, a little bit larger in size. The bottom half of the face is that little bit more condensed. I mean, again, they're all rules to be broken because not all kids have got those sort of faces, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shorthand and it's a starting point, okay? So I'm gonna move on now to animals. I remember this principle I talked about, I'll talk about it one more time where you've got the, basically, the skeleton, haven't you? You've got A, B, C, if you like, head, chest, pelvis, and then you've got the jointed legs and elbows and hands, right? So there you go. Now, we're gonna move on and we're gonna do a stack of animals on this page. All right, so I'm going to do some underdrawing, first of all, okay? Fit one more on here. Yeah, let's do another one up here. Um, ha, confusing myself on this one. Right. Done some underdrawing. Okay. A, B. Oh, you're backwards, aren't you? A, B, C. A, B, C. A, B, C. A, B, C, right? So there's some underdrawing. So now, how about a cat? I'll do one at the end, all right? Um, I'll do one here so you're just gonna get the idea. A, B, See. Right. Basic structure. There's your structure. The same structure, again, as we were talking about with people. The A, B, C. The head, the chest, the pelvis. Shoulders. Elbows, hands. Hips, knees, feet. Little broken down areas. I know someone like to learn about how to draw a car. Okay, a confession. I can't stand drawing cars. Sorry. I really... I'm. I like people, animals, plants, buildings are okay, mechanical objects, cars, things like that. I feel like that's more like technical drawing for me. I can do cartoon cars. I mean, I, I have a go. They're not my favorite thing to draw. Sorry, Susan's nine-year-old son, whatever your name is. Hi. Um, not my favorite things. However, if you've got particular cars you like the pictures of, trace them, copy them, and learn from looking at other pictures how things are constructed. I'll talk a little bit about that later. How are we doing? Not bad, 40 minutes. Right, anyway, let's go back over these. So, 
Let's use the other pen for now, just so it, we can see the difference a little bit. So I wonder how many people have worked out what these are supposed to be. I struggle with giraffes, somebody said that. Yeah, well a giraffe will follow the same principles. Um, I might talk about that in a second. Okay, so, see if you could, obviously, as I start putting these together, you will see exactly what each of these animals is supposed to be, hopefully. Hey, so there's a horse. Now, animals' back legs. A lot of people get confused by this. Um, here's a person's leg. Here's an animal's leg. Okay? That is that. That is that. That is that. And that is that. It's like they're standing on their tippy toe. That's their knee up there. That bit out the back isn't a backwards knee, it's a heel. <laughs> okay? A lot of people get confused by that one, but that's what they are. Anyway, so that was obviously a horse. Now, using those same principles, we have a bird up there. Here, what's this, I wonder? Well, this is... A little doggy. It's a dachshund. Yeah? I guess we know what this one is. Left-handed? No, not left-handed. No. Pictures flipped. I'm doing the letters backwards so you can read them. That's actually my right hand. It's a flipped image so I can see the screen at the same time. Sorry to disappoint you, Lisa, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's what's going on there. See? And then, oh yes, I'm trying to remember what I drew here now. Um, it's always hard when I get to the bottom of the page and I'm going to do a squat here. It's good for the thighs. Um, Pussycat. So there you go. Um, they all follow that same principle underneath everything. Uh, very quickly on that same page, because someone said they struggle with giraffes, let's, let's do the thing. A, B, C, A, B, C. Okay, giraffes have the long neck. Also their back legs are shorter than the front slightly, so you get that slight lean, that slight so, um, slope. So then you just, you know, once you put the, the details in on the top, like that. Oh, the world's scrappiest giraffe, but you'll get the idea. Tail. Yeah? So that's how that one works. Okay. Um, well, we're doing all right. We're about three quarters an hour in. I'm just going to have a little sip of water. Mm. I hope it's not too boring. I hope it's just got some bloke blathering on. Uh, right, what's next then? Let's have a look. Where should we go from here? Um, clothing, could talk a little bit about clothing maybe, about wrinkles and creases and clothing. That might be quite good. Um, I'll see if anything comes up in the questions I can answer and then I might move on to that in a sec. Um, Hope you're all doing okay. I mean, I know this, this is crazy times we're in at the moment, but there's so much creativity going on out there. I'm hoping that some of this is going to get um, carried forward into the future and people will keep this creativity that some of us have been forced into. I do know that some of us are a lot more privileged than others that, you know, we, I'm lucky I have a garden, I have a place I can work from home, uh, light and shade, okay. Um, you know, 
I'm very lucky. I, the people who are working in the front line have a very different experience to have what I'm having of this. And, and um, I don't for one minute think this is holiday and party time. So little things like this that I can do to just help brighten people's lives up is it's the least I can do from my position of privilege uh, to be able to help out. So um, do you have to look things up before you draw them? Not always. That's a good question, Anne. Um, with the trees and the flowers that I'm doing in the morning, yes, I'm going through, I'm going through a list, I'm finding it, and then I'm going online looking at a host of pictures and, and, and sort of going, right, they look like that, and I'm using them as reference so that I get them accurate. A lot of, but, but I hold a, a, f a sort of file in my head of a lot of things in the world. I, I look, I have, a, I have a memory that works visually. So I kind of remember how things look. So I can certainly give a good approximation of what most things look like from memory. It won't be spectacularly accurate every time. If you want it to be accurate, yes, then I will look up, look it up. But I do work a lot from my memory. That is kind of one of the tests I do. But also, you sketch. When you see a thing, you sketch. You make a little note of something that's tricky. Dragons or mythical beasts? Do you start with an animal? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of do a little bit. Okay, that's a good question about that. Again. I follow that same principle. I mean, if you imagine, um, if you imagine that, that that same thing we were talking about just now, the ABC thing. Um, you know, you've got the A, B, C again, the underdrawing, yeah. And then you make the decisions about what sort of a beast it's going to be. Is the dragon going to have spikes on the back of its head there? The neck, the, the wrinkles there. It's going to have you know, big claws at the front, it's going to be resting like on its bent front arms, if you like, front legs. Uh, the back is going to be that back leg thing I was talking about again with the reverse, you know, the knee, the, the heel, it's not a backwards knee. Um, and your, your tail coming off and you think, right, we're going to have some wings off there. So let's just get some wings in there. And that wings are another interesting one, of course. Don't forget with wings, if you've got a bird, if you've got a bird, if an animal that hasn't got front legs like this, when you've got a bird skeleton, yeah, or a bat, or anything of the sort, okay, and you've got a bird, okay, you've got its chest there, but its skull there, let's have been facing off to one side, there's the bird, and you've got wings, wings are hands, you've got an elbow, arm, palm, fingers. So it's the same principles as a hand, and you can, if you're doing a cartoon bird, that's how you can use the wings to sort of point and make expressions, because they are literally hands. So that's, someone asked a question about wings. Why are hands so difficult to draw? Maddie, I'll tell you why, because they've got lots of bits, haven't they? There's so many working parts, all these hinges, all these bits that move. Uh, that's what makes them hard, but you can simplify it. I mean, don't forget, okay? Think, think of the Disney principle, okay? You know, I mean, you can even do the three finger thing, you know, where you go one, two, three. Boom, you've got a hand. Mickey in the gloves. They originally did them with three fingers because it was one less finger to draw, which meant over a film when you're drawing hundreds of, 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 of drawings, it saved time by doing one finger less on each hand and it made them easier to, to manipulate. Um, but yes, you can use that sort of, you know, the bubble hand technique to, to, to do a hand. And, and I often, when I'm doing my, my, my sort of simple sketches, I will just do the underdrawing like that for a hand. Because then you can still go on over the top and put in detail. You know? So even under, under a bubble, you can, you can do that kind of thing. Uh, the other tip with hands, by the way, is is don't do hands where you've got, you know, um, the fingers all do the same thing, okay? Fingers, generally, there's always one or two that are doing something different. So you look on the hand like that, for instance, I've kinked up the, the little finger up there. Uh, if someone is, you know, dropping the hand like that, and you've got the middle and second finger dropping down there. Quite often the third finger might be slightly raised, so you don't need to do the fourth one there. Um, when you, oh, no, 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 clinched. Oh, God, it's hard to draw some of this stuff sometimes. Um, 
with a clenched hand like that. Again, quite often, quite often the little finger does something a bit different to the rest of the fingers. So don't try to make it too um, symmetrical and balanced. Okay, just let it, let it, let it have its own life and energy and shape. Yeah, does that make sense? Um, what was I going to start talking about now? I was going to do stuff about clothing, possibly. I was going to talk a little bit about that. Um, anybody else looking at their hands? <laughs> Are you doing that now? And see what I mean about that, that centre line coming from, the, the, you know, using that. That's the, often, well, when you're pointing, if you look when you point, it's off to one side of your hand. If you follow the line of your arm down, it's that middle finger that follows the line of your arm. So that's often the one that I use to guide everything else. And then all those other shapes can come off of that. Yeah? Ooh, getting covered in ink. Um, okay. Right, let's talk a little bit about clothing. Um, so you've got an arm. And someone's bent their arm like that. Yeah. And you want to put a shirt uh, on this, okay? Think about, imagine it's a relatively tight shirt, okay? And the arm bends like that. The material at the back of the shirt is gonna get brought tight and the material here is what is going to crease. So imagine there's a cuff there. I always like to put little bits like that. So that area there is the bit that's going to crease. And then around the back of the arm, it's going to stay straight. So in, in, in sort of broad terms, it's done that. See what I mean? And then when that straightens out a bit, you'll keep the residual element of that, but you'll the back of the material there. So some of those curves, those creases stay a little bit. I did too many there. Um, and that's not quite so hard and angular. Um, same with like, when I'm doing trousers, you think when someone bends their knee, obviously, the front is going to be along the thigh and the shin. And then there's the hip there. That, that part is pulling tight against the skin, that part, but that is the bit where the creases are going to fall. Okay? Keep them, you don't have to do them complicated. The crease can be done really simply, just literally. Boom, one, two. You've got a crease. Yep. But then when that leg then straightens out, usually there's a bit of a bow in the leg. Where the knee has been pulled tight, it usually gets a little bit of baggy. So I often put a little bit of bag in there. And then you get those residual creases in the back of the trouser that have that slight upward angle because of the way they've been creased. I know that's a bit exaggerated, but you can see what I mean by that. Skirts and dresses and flowing items. Yes, good one. Okay, they're really handy because they can give you a lot of movement. So imagine someone is just standing in there. I'll do a sort of below the knee, A-line cut flowy dress or whatever, okay? So they're standing and their dress. And again, I often do just do a wiggly line like that. And then you find points in that line, like that, to do the folds. And you know that in between the folds there is where the shaving would be. Yeah, so that's hanging, you've got that flow. Then suppose they turn suddenly to one side, and they're gonna, they're, they're gonna turn, they're gonna move their weight onto one leg, and the other leg is gonna come up. So they've done that, they've turned to one side, that, Toes raised up, maybe, so they've turned that way, okay? They've turned. The top of the dress is going to move with the body. That's the part of the body that's moved the most, so that is going to pull. The, the, left, the part that's flowing delays, right? So that way it's longer. So you're going to get a line like that, a flow line, because that is the direction of movement.
Yeah. But suddenly, they're on the move. And it's things like that that give drawings energy and life and movement. You've captured that moment of flow when something has been caught just before it, it settles again. Yeah? Shading. All right, I'll come to some shading in a minute, uh, maybe. Uh, or that. I might do shading in another session. How about that? How about we look at lighting? And maybe, we'll do today will be about structure and form. And maybe if this goes well and people want it, I'll do a light and shade one uh, another time. And I'll do is I'll pre-draw some stuff and then we'll do the, we'll do the shading on it live. Should, should we do that? Um, maybe next week. Um, this movement stuff is teaching more than all the years in art class a long time. Oh, bless you. Thank you, Annie. Um, we did some fantastic stuff. I had brilliant art teachers, and especially when I was working at Disney for a while, we had one of the guys there who was a very good life drawing tutor. And we did these great things where we'd get a life model and we would draw them, but we wouldn't take forever. We would draw really quickly, a minute, two minute pose. And then we'd do a thing where they would, we weren't allowed to draw. They would stand for 30 seconds or a minute. Then they relaxed and then we had to draw it from memory. Or they would stand there and do a pose, but we had to imagine what it looked like from 90 degrees or 180 degrees. And we, so you were using our imagination in combination with what you were seeing and making it work fast. Um, so that was really handy. I keep looking over here rather than at the camera. That was really useful. Um, yeah, uh, I hope that helps. Good lighting is the key to everything, yes. <laughs> Especially in life. Um, I would like to walk around with a ring light in front of me the whole time, making me look beautiful. Yeah, okay, Maddie. so what we'll do next week, we'll do, we, uh, that's a good suggestion. I'll make myself a note when this is over. We'll do one about light and shade next week, uh, or certainly part of it will be about lighting. And I'll pre-draw uh, some faces and stuff, and, and we'll put the shadows in at the time. Am I going to do another class in the near future? I'm hoping to make this a weekly thing, um, if, if people are up for it. Um, uh, yeah. I, I, I would like to. I'd, I'd like to do it if people are vaguely interested in, in sort of hearing more. Then, then I'm happy to to do this. I'll I'll get the feedback at the end and, and see what people say. But yeah, I, I I would once a week, once a fortnight, whatever people think. Um, okay, so materials. So I've done creases. I've done flow. Um, there's also just things like weight, weight of material. You know, like for instance, if you've got a character stood here. Let's just do two really simple, really simple mannequins, if you like. Two simple characters. And they're both wearing a cloak. And this one's wearing a heavy cloak. Sits on the shoulders there. And then hangs. Uses those pleated folds. Hangs down like that. Yeah. And this person is wearing one... And it's just a lighter weight one. And it's just going to, it's not going to hang. It's going to go with the breeze. So you'll get that sense of lightness and movement and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, th this sort of thing also applies to, we were talking about hair earlier on. I'm just going to go back to that very briefly. Um, uh, so again, if you've got someone, let's just do a, a ponytail character. Okay. This character has a ponytail. There we go. She's got a ponytail. It's got a bit of a, got a bit of whoop to it like that. There we go. It's a nice little, nice little ponytail and a little bit of a fringe. Like that. So now, if I draw her looking this way. Okay. She's she's just turned her head. But if I do exactly the same drawing of the face. Right, and there's the hey. But with the ponytail, I do that. You get the sense that she's just whipped the head round like that. Yeah? Um, and then she would whip it round like that and then it would settle, so it would it would come round. This is just a, a, a half a second later, you know. So she's just turned her head there. One. This, she's, she's turned it a couple of seconds before. Um, she's jumping, so she's, she's, she's jumping up in the air. 
Um, and it drags behind like that. But maybe she's jumped off something and she's jumping down. Yeah. Again, it's kind of obvious, but it's just sometimes worth saying. You know, it's the drag. It flows behind. So th that's what another useful thing. It works with hair, it works with skirts, and it gives a, a drawing a moment of energy in life. Yeah? Ah, <sighs> right. How are we doing? We're an hour in. Uh, we're an hour in. Shall I keep going? Do you want me to keep going? Do you want me to shut up? I need a drink. Oh. Um, I could um, let's have a look. I've got plenty of paper, so that's all right. Um, I don't want to overstay my welcome. Um, and we've talked about an awful lot, and I do talk very fast. I do realise that, so there's quite a lot of information gone in there already. Um, what Julian said, grateful we don't want to overtax you. Oh, you know what? I'm not a doctor or a nurse in the front line. I'm sitting here doing some drawings. I'm all right. So uh, I'm quite happy to uh, keep going for a little bit longer if you want me to. Lisa, hi. Um, so, <laughs> hey, come, come. Uh, we have a visitor. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Come and say hello. Hey, it's Ben. Are you going to speak to us? Go on. Oh, apparently we're not saying hello. We're just making duck noises. <laughs> anyway. That's Ben. Off he goes. Bye. Careful. Good boy. Um, a gaping button. Do you mean? Do you mean a gaping button like that? As in, uh, or or like that sort of thing? Is that what you're talking about? Okay. <laughs> right. Well, the button thing. Assuming it's the one where you've got tight buttons. Just think in terms of. That's the button. So this piece of material is over the top. There's a bit of shadow underneath. Let's just give you a little bit of thing like that. Um, uh, and it would just pull a bit tight. So you'd get a couple of creases on the material there. That sort of thing. Is that is that what you meant by gaping button? I, I hope it is. Otherwise, I'm not quite sure um, what that would have meant. Um, oh, someone else asked. Hang on, let me go back. Because there was a... Oh, flowers. Someone mentioned flowers. Labradors. <laughs> Are you the person that sent me a photograph of the Labrador and said, could you draw it? <laughs> I might do some specific ones for next time. Oh, all right, Paul. Yep, good. Glad to help. Right. Um, flowers. Okay. Well, I'm doing my flower drawings every morning, which you're probably seeing. And, um, I mean, flowers. There's, there's a million things. But the thing I often do with the flowers, obviously, is start from the middle. So if you've got the, you know, the pollen bit in the middle... And counting the petals and just making sure that you know say it's a five petal flower three four the oh, four petal flowers it turns out because i can't count um that thing where one always sits over the next um so you're not just doing there's a flower there you know it, it is that sense of there's a softness to them and that you, you know um and then when you've got the the stems come off you know there's going to be that little bit of shade and you're going to get the you know I mean, sorry, it's flowers, it's, it's very, it's, that's probably one of the most basic things I've drawn today, it's rubbish, but, you know, those little things about petals sitting over each other, about them not being completely um, symmetrical, um, little creases, little light and shade, I guess that sort of thing. How do you decide where to put the faces on the flower? Well, I tell you, that, literally, when I look at the flower, each of them tells me their personality, and that's when I decide. If the flower has got one of those nice, you know, if, if you've got a flower that's got a really nice, heavy base like that, you know, that's a great place to put your little faces and stuff. Um, but sometimes you get flowers that are really fluffy or whatever, and, and there's nowhere to put it, but they've got a really nice little area in the middle, so you put a little face in there. Uh, occasionally you get ones that have these double stalks where you get a flower come off, and that's quite fun putting an eye on each one of those occasionally, and just to sort of make them a little quirky. So... It really just, it, it, I, I, until I start the drawing, I have no idea where I'm going to put the fact. None of them are pre-planned. It's the same with the trees. None of them were pre-planned until I start the drawing. And as I start, I do sketch them out first, very lightly in red. Um, they don't count um, in my don't do pre-drawing like I do for my do for the day. 
Um, so as I'm doing the underdrawing, quite often the face suggests itself to me. Um, I know that sounds a bit arty farty, but it is. It's like they are. You train the eye rather than the hand. I assume you need some natural talent. Yes. So someone says, my friend's an art teacher, says you train the eye rather than the hand, but I assume you need some natural talent. Yes. I've always said that you can teach anybody to improve how they can draw, but you can't teach anybody to, to be an artist to draw in the same way that you can teach anybody how to get a tune out of a piano, but you can't teach them how to be a musician. There's an element of that that you're born with, I think. And I'm lucky, I was, I was born with a, a, an ability to draw, to have a hand-eye coordination, to have a memory to draw stuff, and, and I did. But I, I, I absolutely believe that when people say to me, oh, I can't draw, that I can make them draw better. Because anyone can be made to draw better just by a few, you know, some of these tips on, you're following here, if you just follow these, it will help you. But it is very much about the eye. They're right. Your, their teacher was right. It is training the eye. It's, it's a way to look. You don't just look at a thing and look at the shape. You look at what's in front, what's behind, where the lines of energy run through a thing. Um, when I look at an, an organic thing, like a person, a plant, an animal, whatever, I'm not... Sorry, look. They didn't shut the door. Um, I'm not looking at the outline shape. I'm looking at the whole, you know. And, and the outline almost is the last thing that, that's, that, that ties the whole together, if that makes some sort of sense. Which kind of makes sense to what I was saying about the underdrawing before you're getting the shape and the energy and then you're wrapping it up in, in, in the drawing. The drawing is the kind of almost the least important bit. It's the seeing that does count because two people can look at the same thing and, and one try and draw it and the other and one draws it because they look deeper. I think I've gone off on a bit arty thing now, but yeah. Um, thanks for the heads up on the Beardsley. Oh, wasn't it great? Yeah, the thing about Aubrey Beardsley. It was a fabulous programme, the Mark Gatiss programme on BBC Four about Aubrey Beardsley. Extraordinary. I've loved Beardsley ever since I was a pretentious teenager, like he said he was. Um, but I love the simplicity of Beardsley's line. Uh, I think it's incredible. Uh, right, OK, well, let's have a think. Let's put a blank sheet up for a bit and we'll... we'll we're, I think we're heading into about the last 20 minutes now, so... Um, We'll go for the requests thing for a bit. I think I think I've done quite a lot of tips. Or you know, tips coming as part of the requests. I guess people are asking questions about technique and all that sort of thing. So uh, I'm happy to sort of you know, go with the flow really and see what anybody. Um, hello, Carol. See what anybody's asking. Um, uh, we, we, we're down to the hardcore of near about 70 of you now. That's all right. They, uh, we were up to 100 and something at one point. So I think people have been dipping in and out, which is kind of nice. An elephant, please. An elephant. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, as we're doing elephant, I'm going to do that, talk about this, the structure again, the underdrawing. So you've got your, you've got your ABC a, again, yeah? And you've got your, you know, you've even got those, those same undershapes like that. That could be anything. That could be a dog, a cat, couldn't it? Okay, so it's what we put over the top now. Now, elephants are great. They've got these amazing, amazing faces, obviously. Um, and those wonderful, wonderful ears. And then... Quite tricky to draw, I must admit. I do find them sometimes a little bit tricky to draw. You do need to sort of, you know, like I say, with a lot of this stuff, it's um oh, actually elephants are sneaky. They've got they actually have I I went wrong there. Elephants actually have a, have the knee lower down. They don't have the reverse leg. They are one of the one of the few animals that actually or well, their reverse leg effect is much lower. Yeah, I I I, I took myself up in the wrong direction there. Um yeah. So, uh, so the world's worst elephant. Sorry, but you know, that's um. <laughs> there we go. Um, ah dear. Um, yeah, it's a terrible elephant. I'm, I apologise for that elephant. That is basically like a corgi in an elephant suit. It's rubbish. Um, <laughs> it's probably the worst. I'm going to turn the page because that is just dire. Um, how would you draw a wheel with a flat tire? <laughs> okay, wheel sunflower. Oh. Wait for a sunflower in the. I will do. There will be a sunflower in the flowers series. I assure you. A cartoon chihuahua, pets, mouse, dog, cat. Right. Ooh, ah, ah. 
lots of things. Expressions like humour. There was a lot of stuff about expressions earlier on, but I can come back to that. I can do a few of those in a minute. Oh, what, what, what was I about to do? A wheel with a flat tire. Okay. I'll go back to the terrible page with the elephant on it because I've got a bit of space. I mean, literally, if you if you you know you've got your wheel, yeah. But think about the ground will be there. Well, obviously with the flat tire, you're going to bring the ground up further, but you want to keep that same amount of volume. So you literally just squash it like that, if that makes any sense. Can you show again looking up and looking down faces? Um, I won't draw it again right now, but what if you, when this finishes, if you just, it will save onto my timeline. Just go back and have a quick look at, at that. And, um, and uh, mole, cats, dogs, mice. Um, right, let me think. Cartoon expressions and a few animals. Okay, cartoon expressions and a few animals. Okay, let's do some of those. Let's do, let's let's do, let's do the animals first. Then I'm going to do the cartoon expressions. Okay, so someone said uh, a cartoon chihuahua. Okay, well that's fun because you've basically got um, they've got their little skinny legs, haven't they? Like that. And let's have this one sitting down. So it's doing that. Then they've got the. Do a few cartoon animals, why not, why not? There we go. Cartoon chihuahua, okay. Um, somebody asked for. <laughs> Humble snowdrop. What's the difference between a leopard and a tiger? Um, proportions. Who was that? Let's have a look. Fair enough. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Oh gosh, right, okay. Remind me of that one if I don't do it when I come out of the animals. Um, uh, mouse, okay, let's do a little mouse. There's a little mouse for you, okay. Thanks for the chihuahua, he looks like mine. <laughs> Great, <laughs> with the cross eyes. Um, uh, so I, said, I love moles. Mole. I do love a mole. Now, usually, that, usually there'd be a lot of shading on a mole. I'm not going to spend the time doing that, obviously. But yeah, there's a mole. Blackbird, Black, uh, well, woo, it's very specific. Blackbird, I mean, the great thing about a blackbird, it's pretty much what you think of as a classic bird shape. Um, I, do, I do love the fact that a blackbird is sort of proportionately what one would draw if you say, draw a bird. Um, yeah, blackbird. Um, uh, Let's just fit a couple more animals on here. Um, 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 what other pets do people have? I don't know. Guinea pig. Let's have a little guinea pig. Guinea pigs are great. They've got those great lugubrious faces, haven't they? A bull. I'm going. I'm in the full squat now. This is this. My thighs are going to be pumped up like crazy. Um, a bull. My pen's running out. That's going to be the cue to stop soon because I need to get a different pen. So I'll have a new one for next week. Um, Ah, bulls. Now, great thing, oh, we're doing cartoon animals, which is good. What I love about bulls, and it's th this thing about, about um, taking the characteristics of an animal and pushing it. I love they have these fantastic big backs, but they have these incredibly tiny little legs, don't they, bulls? So, you know, you can, 
you can give them the, the most pathetically tiny little skinny legs. It's a ball, so let's give it. A... Um, Yeah, you see what I mean? I love the fact that you can give these uh, these tiny little, tiny little legs. Okay, <sighs> one more, one more. Let's do the lizard then, okay. Let's do that. There you go. Uh, right, I'm just going to finish off with a few. Uh, someone talked about cartoon expressions. Where are we? To quarter past. Um, uh, so, cartoon expressions. What's great fun about cartoon expressions is pushing a normal expression to, to extremes. So, you know, if someone is like, Okay, but again, one of the things that's worth looking at on these sort of things is, is trying to avoid anything being oversymmetrical. Again, look at, look at the angle of the mouth. It's not the same as the angle of the eyes. We've pushed it off. The mouth itself is, is, um, is not symmetrical. Um, okay, symmetry is our, is, is our enemy. So we're looking at... Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of talk about them a little bit after I've done after I after I've done them. Um, Let's just put a, just a bit of a nice, a nice fun on at the bottom. Oh, this pen's really losing it. I am on the pretty much the last couple of drawings now before I have to sort of pack it in. Right. Okay. So you were asking about cartoon expressions and about what it was about them that you know how they work, sort of thing. So here we go. So let's see if I can sort of point out. So as you say, with the um, with the sort of the <clears throat> sort of face, it's the asymmetrical mouth, putting the pupils of the you know opening the eyes big, one slightly bigger than the other, usually the one that's closer to us, obviously, putting the, the pupils right on the edge of the white, lifting so you're, you've drawn everything out like that. And this one, the sneaky, <laughs> sneaky look, bringing the eyebrows in. Look at look at the shape of the eye now. I've done the flat on the top, and he's looking up out of the top of his eye like that. The smile's come up there and it's bunched the cheek there. So you don't need to draw the whole thing, but there's the crease there and it's pushed that crease at the bottom of the eye up there. And again, it's off to one side. That's done that. The ooh face, you're pushing the mouth forward. Ooh, so the mouth goes forward. The eyes are wide. I've done that thing I talked about earlier of taking the eyebrows like that. And the pupils 
sitting within the eye, so you've got white all around them, which open, mine don't do that, but it opens them up a lot more like that. Leopard and tiger, I'll finish with that in a second. Thank you for reminding me, Anna. This is the sort of the grumpy, the grumpy teenager face. So I can't think where I see this at all from, <coughs> really. So, um, again, it's similar in a lot of ways to this, where you've got the, the eyes, fairly similar on both of those, the flat eye at the top, the frown, but you see how that one creases the smile up there and that one pushes the mouth forward in that direction again. So you do the expression, hmm, feel the directions and push them further. And of course, a nice big smile to finish. Right, I'm gonna do one more and then we're gonna knock it on the head. Someone asked if it's with a leopard and a tiger. Now this is very specific and I won't be zoologically accurate, but hopefully I can um, enlighten a bit because it's basically they're both cats. So you've got your, 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 your cat underdraw, haven't you? You know, with a leopard, you've got your the head shape. And this is gonna be the world's worst leopard, okay? Please don't hold me to task over this. This is not a, um, and there's a slimness and they've got a, a lightness to their limbs because they're very lithe and agile. And you're gonna have, have this kind of thing, okay? Okay, it's something like that, right? So a leopard will be along those lines. Then if you've got your tiger, which is gonna be the same underdraw pretty much. And it's all about attitude as well. I would, I would give a tiger a heavier stance. I would usually actually drop its head a bit more there. Uh, the head is much bigger. And whereas with a leopard, you're kind of doing, you know, this kind of a face shape with a leopard. With a tiger, you're working almost on a big um, diamond. So you've got that, and it's going to have a, it's going to have a, Whereas a leopard I see with a sort of neck like that, with a tiger it's sort of heavier, the shoulders are high, like that. And then the great thing about tigers, they have these whopping great feet as well. So, and you've got, with a leopard, you've got the, the dainty claws. With the tiger you'd have much bigger claws. And there's this sort of element of trying to resist drawing Shere Khan, but just... Uh, <laughs> Um, so that's the sort of thing I would do if, you know, you're looking at the two, they're both big cats, they've both got the same underdraw, but then you're, you're imposing the personality of the animal on top of it, finding the sort of the bigger shapes, the, the weight, the way it's sunk into its shoulders, whereas that is lighter on its shoulders and lighter on its shoulders. Um, yeah, so there we go. I'll have a quick flick through just, just to finish off at rapid speed. We talked about face proportions and looking up and looking down. We talked about pushing the proportions around. We talked about noses. We talked about eyebrows. We talked about different ways of caricaturing in different parts of the face. I've talked about drawing underneath and building over the top with a character. We talked about energy movement and underdrawing. We talked about how the same underdrawing can work for a skinny or a fat character. We talked about hand structure. We talked about hair, we talked about adults and children's faces, we then talked about the ABC underdrawing and how that works for pretty much everything. We, talked, we did a dragon, we talked about wings that are basically hands, we did more about hands. Ooh. We talked about creases in clothes, we talked about flowing material, flowing of movement and light and heavy drapes and how that can apply to hair as well. A little bit about flowers. Uh, and then we went to some requests for elephants, flat tyre, cartoon animals, a few more animals, tiny legs, um, cartoon expressions, and we finished with the leopard and the tiger. Oh. Well, that was um, hour and 25. I think I'm done. Mm.
it's only water today. The evening session, I have a nice glass of wine with me. Didn't think I could really have a glass, although, you know, what the hell, but I thought better not have a glass of wine in case the kiddies are watching. So I hope that uh, you got something out of that. If any of you do any practicing drawing and stuff and feel like you want to post, please, in the comments below, post a picture that you've done based on what you've seen. And um, I, I would love to see some of your, your feedback on that. Um, yeah, and if, if you think any of your friends might have enjoyed it, they can always catch it on the on the um, on my timeline. It's gonna it's gonna be on there to watch at their at their leisure. They don't have to watch me live. Um, and uh, let's let's meet up again next week. I, I'm not sure what time. I'll put another um, another event notice up to let you know when uh, when I'm gonna be because I've got a few conference calls and things and a couple of things lined up. But um, yes, I will definitely do another one uh, next week. And I think the Facebook one does work better than the Instagram, I'm afraid, um, simply because of shapes. So any of the Insta people will be able to follow me on here. Um, all right, listen, be safe, stay at home. If you can, if you have to go out, if you're a frontline worker, please, please, please stay safe. Follow all your safety protocols. Thank you so much for everything you do and keeping the rest of us going. Um, I will see you all next week at some point. Take care, everybody, and thank you so much for watching.